OK, bonsoir tout le monde. Bienvenue à la Faculté de droit de l'Université McGill. Mon nom est Daniel Jutra, je suis le doyen de la faculté. Je suis très heureux de vous accueillir ce soir à cet événement privilégié, le 2014 Robert S. Litvak Award in Lecture. Uh, in, in a moment, uh, we'll have an opportunity to introduce our uh, guest of honor, Mr. Joseph Arvey, QC. Uh, with me in front are Mr. Arvey and uh, my colleague, Professor Colleen Shepard, the director of the Center of Human Rights and Legal Pluralism, who will be the moderator for our question period after the lecture. Je voudrais commencer uh, peut-être en vous expliquant un peu le, la source de, ce, de cet événement et du prix Robert Litvak. Et uh, pour expliquer la chose plus clairement, j'ai fouillé un peu dans les archives. On a encore ici uh, étonnamment des archives papier à la faculté. On en a quelques-unes. Euh, des classeurs dans lesquels se trouvent des, des papiers qui euh, tomberont bientôt dans l'oubli parce qu'ils ne sont pas en forme digitale. So one of the pieces of paper I found in the Robert S. S. Litvak uh, Award file is the very first letter sent to one of my predecessors, Dean Roderick McDonald, by one, let me check, Gordon L. Eckenberg, from Jade Solomon, who's well known here, I think, uh, for many of you, uh, explaining what the idea was. So it says, further to our telephone conversation of yesterday, the following is a brief resume of an award that the family of my partner, Robert S. Litvak, wished to establish. It is based on the philosophy that one man, I think today one would say one person, but back then it was probably fine to say one man can make a difference. In the context of the center that Professor Kotler wishes to establish, so you have to understand this is prior to the creation of the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism, in the context of the creation of that center and the related lectures that are being established, it was felt that a memorial award in Bob's name would be fitting. So the reason I'm reading this is uh, the, the core of what I want to read is right now. A brief summary of the thinking that has gone into this proposal is that semicolon. One. One man can make, it, it's typical Gordon Eckenberg style, for those of you who are his friends, typical. One. One man can make a difference. Two. The people in whose names the proposed lectures are being established are all individuals who've made a difference. Three. The personalities involved in human rights activities at McGill, such as Frank Scott and Professor Kotler, are all individuals who've made a difference. Four, in the case of this memorial award, Bob, as a practicing lawyer, and although involved primarily in commercial and corporate activities, was an attorney who took on cases that made a difference. I could go on, but I think you get the gist of what was meant here. One person can make a difference really is, I think, the underlying idea of this series of conferences. And it is meant, therefore, to recognize someone whose activities in the human rights field has had a significant impact. Uh, le prix a été donné à quelques reprises depuis sa création en 1987 à des gens qui ont été actifs sur plusieurs scènes qui vont du droit autochtone jusqu'à uh, la situation en Amérique du Sud uh, ou au Moyen-Orient. Robert Litvak himself is a graduate of this faculty, graduated in 1963 and uh, as was just mentioned, was a commercial lawyer who took time away from his practice to advocate in uh, human rights issues, and particularly involved in two cases that were high profile and that students in this faculty will recognize one case in which he advocated pro bono for the Inuit in the very important James Bay litigation that eventually uh, led to an historic native land settlement in 1975 involving uh, the Quebec government and Hydro-Quebec. And in another case, Blakey, 1980, uh, Robert Litvak advocated for minority language rights in Quebec in this landmark Supreme Court case. In many ways, I think it needs to be said that our guest tonight is probably the champion of those people. So to give you a sense of, uh, of what I mean by this, a champion of those advocates bringing cases to the Supreme Court of Canada in uh, human rights and constitutional cases. Just to give you a sense of this, I did what uh, students do now and scholars do now. I went to a website with lots of data in there and mined a little bit of that data. So I punched in Arve, just Arve, on the Supreme Court Judgment website. And 61 different cases come up. 
Now, to me, this is an absolutely staggering number. 61 cases from 1983 to the most recent in 2013, AG Canada and Bedford, uh, the case involving the downtown east side sex workers. And I w I'm sure if you ask him, he will say the most exciting one is the next one. I think that's the standard thing that is said in those cases. And the next one is the Carter case that you've heard about uh, and that leads to, uh, that uh, involves end of life issues. Just again to give you a taste of the significance of Mr. Arvey's contribution, let me make a quick list. I'm, I'm going to run quickly through this because these are little buzzwords for law students. You'll recognize basically your entire education in human rights and constitutional law in this list. And this is just a small sample of the cases in which Mr. Arvey was involved either as party or as represent counsel for party or counsel for the intervener. So, Edwards Books, Andrews and Lost Society of BC, Reference Re Workers' Compensation, Irwin Toy, Butler, Egan, Dalgamook, Thompson Newspapers, Ryan and City of Victoria, Blencoe and BC Human Rights Commission, Little Sisters Book and Art Emporium 1, 2, and maybe 3 or 4 or 5, I lost count at some point, Chamberlain, Paul and BC Forest Appeal Commission, Malmo Levine, Joe, this is the one that I actually heard you argue in, in you asked yesterday which one it was. It was Malmo Levine. Reference Sim, Sex Marriage. I was there as well to hear you. And then Fiddler, Sun Life Insurance, King Street in New Brunswick, in Canada, and Omar Kadar. Think about that. All of these cases connected to one man. So I have to stop now. I think the awe that I've created with this list should be sufficient to justify your presence here. I would like you to welcome with me both Mr. Arvey and Sylvia Litvak, who is the widow of Robert Litvak, the spirit behind this award, uh, who kept the uh, initial lecture series going with the enthusiasm and support of Erwin Kotler and Gordon Ackenberg and Joe Nuss and many others who are basically the people who set the stage for the creation of our very successful Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. Sylvia, please join us. you can all see me and I hope more importantly you can hear me. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Dean Jutra for those very kind and very eloquent words and you have left me nothing to say. <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I was asked if I could um, introduce the award and introduce the speaker and I'm going to do my best. So hello everyone. As you've just heard it's going to be my pleasant task tonight to introduce Joseph Arvey, who is a recipient this year of the Robert Lidvak Award, which was established, as you've just heard, in 1987 in memory of my husband, to tell you a little about both men and what this award represents. I'm gratified to see so many familiar and friendly faces, but also a little daunted. You see, I, I've now been coming back to Miguel for some 27 years in this role, and so finding something new and fresh to say is a bit of a challenge. I'm, however, relying on the fact that the most faithful among you are not getting any younger either. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps your memory is not as keen as it once was, and you will not remember much of what I said on past occasions. And for those of you who are new to this event, and particularly for the students among you, let me tell you why we're here. When my husband died in 1987, after a brief but epic battle with cancer, he was barely 50. But he'd already done a great deal to strengthen the respect of the rule of law and the defense of the individual against arbitrary power, a principle to which this award is dedicated. He wasn't, as you've heard, a civil rights lawyer by training, and only a strong sense of justice and a very lively contrarian spirit drove him in the early 70s to take on the Quebec government of the day, which had announced and started the construction of the James Bay hydroelectric project without, if you can imagine, any consultation whatsoever of the native people who had lived on these lands since time immemorial. 
and with a small band of merry men, Jimmy O'Reilly, Max Bernard among them, and many others whose name I should quote but I've forgotten, uh, and noted environmental experts who donated their time as resources for this fight were non-existent, a landmark judgment was won, leading to a settlement and establishing a foundation for Aboriginal rights in Canada. Having by then developed a taste for defying arbitrary power, he was before the courts again when yet another Quebec government sought to abolish the equal status of English and French as the official languages of legislation and the courts, a status guaranteed by the Canadian Constitution. Again, the issue as he saw it wasn't just a matter of linguistic tolerance and respect for the two historical cultures of Canada, but whether constitutions and charters of rights and freedom are worth the paper they are written on. If you do not believe that these issues matter, just ask the ordinary citizens of Russia, China, or Egypt, all blessed with comprehensive constitutions guaranteeing their basic rights, what protection they can expect when their individual freedom is threatened. I have many memories of these heady times, some in the very early morning, when Bob, in the middle of shaving, would take calls for live radio from Barbara Frum, uh, on As It Happens, and if some of you younger people here do not know who Barbara Frum was, ask any gray-haired member of the audience, and you can see we were lucky to rely on radio rather than television in those days. We had some hate calls as well, one in particular from a woman who rang at four in the morning to shout, Vive le Québec libre, to which Bob, still half asleep but always courteous, replied, Mais madame, vive tout le monde libre. <laughs> Which was, after all the reason, he was engaged in this particular fight. The caller was so astonished, she hung up before he had a chance to explain to her what he was trying to accomplish. And much to my relief, because I wanted to go back to sleep. <laughs> McGill's law faculty did not, however, as you've just heard, need much convincing. The very year that Bob died, this award was created in recognition of outstanding lifetime achievement in advancing civil liberties and human rights. Over the years, it's been given to a number of nominees from Chile, Canada, East Jerusalem, the US, Egypt, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan, and many of you remember these nominees were extraordinary. Brave individuals who often, at great risk to themselves, spoke out in the defense of the rule of law. Which brings me now to our nominee, Joseph Arvey. Mr. Arvey, as you've just heard, is a distinguished Vancouver-based civil rights lawyer, a graduate of both the University of Western Ontario and Harvard, who has been variously described as one of the most influential lawyers of Canada, a civil warrior who perhaps has had more influence on contemporary Canadian life and values than anyone, and Canada's crusading civil rights lawyer. Madame Justice Michelle Rivet calls him one of Canada's most tireless civil and human rights lawyers, who's made an exceptional commitment to human rights in this country, and Peter Zowski describes him as having had a remarkable role in shaping how our Constitution is interpreted. Perhaps the accolade I like best is that of Craig Jones, a law professor and frequent opponent of Mr. Harvey, who said his greatest gift is that he has the brilliance to throw all the marbles in the air and know he's the one who will catch them. <coughs> Joe, I'm sorry if this is embarrassing, but be thankful you'll never have to listen to your eulogy. <laughs> so what has he done to deserve such respect from his peers? He has successfully litigated often pro bono, a number of landmark constitutional cases in areas as diverse as sexual orientation, same-sex marriage, collective bargaining, the rights of addicts to safe injections, the protection of sex workers, as well as that of Aboriginal rights. Most recently, he has been the lead counsel in the Carter-Taylor case on the right to physician-assisted dying a case now headed for the Supreme Court of Canada, I believe next October. 
after an initial groundbreaking judgment in the BC Supreme Court. But while Mr. Arvey can usually be found before the courts, as you've just heard, he is no stranger to law schools. In 2012, he was the inaugural constitutional litigator in residence at the University of Toronto Asper Center and visiting clinical fellow at York, Osgoode Hall, and McMurtry. He was Queen's Counsel after only 10 years at the bar, is a fellow of the Litigation Council of America and of the American College of Trial Lawyers, and a member of both the Bar of British Columbia and that of the Yukon. What you will not find out, however, in his official biography, which I've learned just recently, is that he's a sailor, and a single-handed one at that. Now, that does give me pause, and it certainly would if I was opposing counsel. Bef <laughs> Mr. Harvey will talk to you about litigating charter challenges. And having had a sneak preview of his eloquence today in a midday seminar, I can assure you you're about to be enlightened, entertained, and never left indifferent. Before I turn you over to him, I would like to add a short personal comment. When Joe's name was first put forward for this award, I found many echoes and parallels in the issues he's pursued and those that had mattered to Bob. The latest case he has undertaken to allow within strict parameters physician-assisted dying has for me struck a particular chord. It has long been my belief and that of my husband that the right to die with the help of a willing physician when life is unendurable is one of the last human rights without universal recognition that a number of patients are left to suffer physical and emotional pain that cannot be alleviated despite the best palliative care, watched in despair by those who love them, will be, I hope, viewed in a few years with the same horror and disbelief with which we now look upon the worst abuses of slavery. Recognition of human rights is a slow and ongoing process. This legal battle, which has been won in some jurisdictions, is just beginning in earnest in Canada. It takes courage, wisdom, compassion, and persistence to challenge received ideas, particularly when they're so deeply intertwined with powerful emotions of love, of sorrow, of fear of death, and dread of bereavement, and for some, in conflict with deeply held religious beliefs. It takes effort to bring about legal reforms which are desired by the overwhelming majority of electorates as demonstrated by poll after poll in Canada and elsewhere, but that are strenuously opposed by vocal and influential minorities often regrouped as single issue voters. As a result to this day, many compassionate physicians have to risk their liberty and their livelihood in order to help their patients who wish to, as one French politician called it, turn out the light when they decide it is time. So for my part, having had to fight for this right, not once, but twice in my lifetime, most recently this past spring, on behalf of someone who shared my life for many years, I salute the efforts of Mr. Harvey and wish him every success in his quest. I hasten to say that this is my very own conviction and in no way represents the point of view of McGill in this very difficult matter of conscience. I was trusted to make this introduction and hope I will be invited again. <laughs> it now gives me great pleasure to present the Robert Lidback Award to Mr. Harvey, but si vous me permettez, j'ai encore trois ou quatre minutes. Permettez-moi de profiter des quelques minutes qui me restent pour vous dire quelques mots dans ma langue maternelle. Je ne vous ferai pas l'insulte de tout reprendre depuis le début et de mettre ainsi en doute votre parfaite connaissance de la belle langue de Shakespeare avant de rendre hommage à celle de Molière, ni surtout le risque de vous endormir tous. 
Vous aurez bien compris que Joseph Harvey, qui reçoit ce soir le prix Robert Litvak à la mémoire de mon mari, disparu en 1987, est un brillant et chevronné défenseur des droits de ceux qui ont le plus de difficultés à se faire entendre. Les homosexuels, les travailleurs du sexe, les toxicomanes et les autochtones du Canada. Son combat le plus récent est celui qui me touche de plus près et de permettre le droit à l'aide d'un médecin consentant lorsqu'un patient incurable décide que sa vie n'est plus endurable. Si le droit au, su au suicide existe bien au Canada, par contre, l'aide d'un médecin reste un crime inscrit dans notre code pénal, ce qui oblige les médecins compatissants à risquer leur liberté et leur droit d'exercer. Si bien des juridictions européennes et américaines sont en avance sur nous dans ce domaine, le débat reste entier au Canada, où s'opposent encore les convictions religieuses ou éthiques de certains et le souhait de plus en plus majoritaire des électeurs de choisir librement d'éteindre la lumière lorsque la vie devient insoutenable. Mon mari, Robert Liva, qui perdit son combat contre le cancer à l'âge de 50 ans, aurait applaudi et soutenu les efforts de M. Harvey comme je le fais moi-même. S'étant battu toute sa vie, si courte qu'elle fût, contre l'arbitraire et le déni des droits qui sont notre héritage commun, d'abord pour les Inuits, totalement ignorés lors de la construction du barrage La Bay James, et plus tard pour le respect des droits linguistiques garantis par la Constitution canadienne à tous les Québécois, Bob aurait été particulièrement fier de savoir le prix dédié à sa mémoire décerné à Joseph Harvey, et c'est avec grand plaisir que j'ai l'honneur enfin de le lui remettre et de lui passer la parole. Monsieur Joseph Harvey. Merci beaucoup, uh, Sylvia Litvak. Merci. Uh, thank you very much. And I know a few students are just coming in right now because they had a class until 6 o'clock. So uh, without further ado, it's my great honor to turn the floor over to Mr. Joseph Harvey. Well, thank you for that very kind and embarrassing introduction. Um, I never really know what to say after those kind of words are said about me, except thank you. I'm very honored to have been asked to give this year's lecture in honor of Robert Litvak. Um, Robert's uh, pathfinding work in the area of both Aboriginal rights and language rights is impressive, and his untimely death at the age of 49 was obviously not only a tragic personal loss to Sylvia, but a great loss to the profession. The title um, that I chose for this lecture is Litigating the Charter, Stories of a Constitutional Lawyer. I chose the word stories somewhat deliberately. I didn't want the lecture to be too doctrinal. I didn't want to come here and lecture you on what the law is or what the, uh, on any particular subject. You can all find out what the law is by reading the decisions of our courts. Indeed, this is what you do um, and learn in law school. I've always thought what students and indeed lawyers would benefit from at least as much as reading the decision is the story behind the decision. What the lawyer who worked on the case did and thought about how the case was put together, the various strategies and tactics that were considered, the ideas that may actually have ended up as dead ends and were not, were not pursued. This is not something that's really taught in law school as far as I know. And so I thought this is what I would do today. Of course, in, in telling such a story, I run the risk of being, labor, being labeled rather just an old warrior uh, telling an irrelevant war story. But I'll take that risk in the hope that something might be gleaned from my story that will assist you in your future as potential constitutional litigators or just potential litigators. Because another reason I use the word stories in my title is because it is my belief that litigation is in essence the telling of your client's story, whether to a judge or to a jury. And I'm a great believer in the idea that the best storyteller wins. 
In charter litigation, it is important to tell a story of great injustice. I was recently criticized by a law professor in a magazine article who said this of me. He said, his success depends on persuading the court that his client's personal drama is of the utmost significance. And those persons for whom the law is enacted, who will be stripped of the law's protection in order to accommodate his clients, just don't matter all that much. He said there's nothing egalitarian about what he does. Well, I take great exception to this. For, what, for sure, one of the things I try to do is to make sure the court fully understands the impact of the challenged law on my clients. This requires plenty of evidence of how the law actually operates and the hardship it creates. Long gone are the days when constitutional law involved the purely normative exercise of figuring out what the lofty phrases like liberty and freedom and equality mean. Today, constitutional law means getting your hands real dirty and demonstrating the law's impact on real people. So I don't take the position that those persons for whom the law is enacted don't matter. Rather, I try to show that it's not necessary to trounce on my client's rights in order to protect the rights of others. Or simply, I try to show that on balance, the harms to my clients are simply greater than the harms to those the law is designed to protect. And sometimes I try to show that the rights of others don't matter as much as the government might think they matter. And this is because the government's concerns are based on speculation or theory rather than on evidence or real life. Now, in trying to come up with a story to tell you today, the problem I had was that I have many stories that I'm able to tell since I've litigated just about every provision in the Charter over the last um, many, many years of my career. As mentioned, and some of you will know, some of my cast Past cases include arguing in favor of same-sex marriage, the right of workers to collectively bargain, the rights of Aboriginal people, the rights of sex workers, the rights of drug addicts, the rights of offspring of sperm donors, donors to name a few. The backstory to each of these cases are, is, is very interesting, but none of them is what I've chosen to talk about today. I've had clients as diverse as the Bishop of Bountiful in the polygamy case to the transgender beauty queen who took on Donald Trump when he denied her the right to compete in Miss Universe. And more recently, I represent the Hells Angels in their constitutional challenge to the province's civil forfeiture laws. But I'm not going to tell their stories either. In addition to my work on the Carter Right to Die case, I'm presently working on cases as diverse as the right to food for children, the right, for private, the right of privacy for all Canadians concerned with the power of CSEC to spy on Canadians, and the rights of the wrongfully convicted. But with one exception, and that being a short story on the Carter case, if time permits, I'm not going to talk about any of those cases either. The one case I thought I would make for the best story was the one I did for a teacher by the name of James Chamberlain, who wanted to read to his students in kindergarten in grade one a book entitled One Dad, Two Dads, Blue Dads, Green Dads. This is a book that portrays same-sex families in a very positive light, and the local school board objected and prohibited him from doing so. I remember actually starting out the case by asking the judge to imagine that she was in kindergarten and I then read the book to her in my sing-song voice. I think she might have thought my yen for storytelling was taken a bit too far in that case, although we did okay. Nor will I tell you about the case in which I got to cross-examine Stephen Harper for two days when he was the chair of the National Citizens Coalition, not because it's not a great story, but because nothing useful came out of it. <laughs> I decided to focus on only one case, and an old one at that, and that is for a couple of reasons. For one, it might be my all-time favorite case, if it's not necessarily the most important. But it might also be the one that might fit this, uh, the reason for this award, which is for a person who made a contribution, and I'm quoting, to the defense of the rule of law and the protection of the individual against arbitrary power. And although the case is an old one, it remains an important one both for the reasons that we won and also for the reasons that we lost. Because when I tell you about the part we lost, you'll know that there remains important battles ahead. 
And one of the important doctrinal lessons that came from the recent Bedford case, the sex workers case, and one that I'm proud to say I had a little bit to do with, is that the doctrine of stare decisis, or precedent, um, being a common law doctrine, is, is now considered subordinate to the Constitution. Which means that if any of you, when you graduate, think that some previous decision of the Supreme Court of Canada is wrong, you should know that it's not impervious to challenge, even at the lower courts. So let me tell you the story of the case that the media billed Little Sisters versus Big Brother. <clears throat> It was once upon a time, and very soon after I started my law practice, that I was called by the president of the BC Civil Liberties Association to see if I would take on what he described as a rather simple case of government censorship. Specifically, it related to the conduct of the Canadian customs, which had prohibited the, in, the entry into Canada of books and other expressive material that had been imported by a local gay and lesbian bookstore, the Little Sisters Book and Art Emporium. I told the caller that as I just started my practice, I didn't have the ability to do the case pro bono, and he said, not a worry, we usually, we know, we, we usually know, we, we get what we pay for, and this case is not gonna take too long, a couple days of preparation and one day in court. That call came sometime early in 1990. The case ended in 2007. <laughs> now every case starts with a client with a problem. The lawyer's role is to find the best way to solve the problem. Sometimes the nature of the case is such that the nature of the problem solving is relatively easy and follows a well-worn path that has been cut by many lawyers before you. Your job in that instance is simply to apply the familiar template to your new fact pattern. But sometimes the way to solve the problem is not so obvious. And indeed, for most constitutional law cases that I've been involved in, that is the case. Almost by definition, when one is asked to take on a constitutional case, one is asked to uh, challenge the existing legal regime. And that challenge is usually un unique and requires some innovative problem solving. Now in my case, I had two clients. One was a civil liberties association and the other a gay and lesbian bookstore. They had one common objective, how to stop customs from banning books at the Canadian border. However, they had somewhat different, excuse me, motivations. One was largely philosophical, the Civil Liberties Association. The other was very practical, they had a business to run. But at the same time, it very personal, although it took me a while to fully understand just how personal. I want to describe for you how I went about trying to solve their problem. My first thought was simply to challenge the correctness of a particular customs decision. Two books had, had recently been seized. I thought, why not just use the, the administrative machinery of the Customs Act and appeal the customs decision and argue that these two books were not obscene? This would have been, in effect, a little obscenity trial. And a ruling that customs was wrong in determining that these two books were not obscene would presumably be of precedential importance, since it would thereafter limit and guide customs on what they could do next time around. We discussed this with the client. They told me that they did this once. They had hired a lawyer, spent all the money that they had, and literally on the day of the trial, the lawyer for customs simply showed up and conceded that customs had made the wrong decision. There was therefore no trial and no decision. And in that case, what had been banned were magazines, and by the time the trial was to start, the magazines were completely outdated, and what was worse, customs had destroyed them. The client did not want to, uh, to repeat that utterly frustrating and unrewarding experience. The problem, of course, was not one book. The clients explained that since most gay and lesbian pornography was not produced in Canada, most of their inventory had to be imported. And they told me that every shipment that they ordered was being opened and inspected by customs, which meant lengthy delays in getting their orders and many books and videos prohibited entry. Inve and as well, inventory, once it was arrived, it arrived damaged. So the problem appeared systemic to me. And systemic problems require systemic solutions. So we, tried, we decided to try something that had never been done before. This was to argue that even though the law on its face was apparently valid, because the Supreme Court of Canada had not too long before decided that, the, uh, that Parliament could competently um, uh, prohibit obscenity consistent with the Charter. So even though the law was apparently valid, we wanted to show that if in practice, 
If in practice the law resulted in customs detaining and prohibiting large amounts of non-obscene material, even the law said only obscene, that the law should be struck down. There was no authority for such proposition in Canadian law. The court had never struck down the law simply because from time to time it was misapplied by the bureaucrats who were to administer it. But I thought that if I could prove on the evidence that the mal maladministration of the customs legislation was systemic and, and endemic, then I might be enough, that might be enough to strike down the law that inevitably led to what was essentially over-censorship. Or at the very least, obtain declaratory and perhaps injunctive relief from the courts um, to that effect. Now, I've been reading the academic writings of American scholars, and especially one by the name of Professor Thomas Emerson, who is a great critic of prior restraint. And he, this is what Professor Emerson wrote. He said, a system of prior restraint normally brings within the complex of government machinery a, f a far greater amount of communication than a system of subsequent punishment. And he put it pithily when he said, the function of the censor is to censor. And he said, the long history of prior restraint reveals over and over again the personal and institutional forces inherent in the system, which nearly always end in stupid, unnecessary, and extreme suppression. So then I understood what I had to do. My challenge was to try to prove the truth of what was, for Professor Emerson, just a theory. But how was I to do that? I was acting for a nonprofit civil liberties association whose budget for the case was pretty well used up in about a week after we started, and a small struggling bookstore who on a good day barely made, made ends meet. Given that almost all of its inventory was imported and was routinely inspected, detained and prohibited by customs, its revenue was drastically affected by the very customs legislation we were challenging. Well, the task was daunting. Any systemic challenge is, how many bad decisions did we need to prove to bring down the whole customs regime? There were 4,000 custom officers across 240 ports in Canada, each of whom were authorized to detain and prohibit any book, magazine, film, video, or anything else that was expressive that they, in their own wisdom, deemed to be obscene. Well, we started with a multi-pronged approach. We decided to pick a 10-year period. And through the pretrial discovery process, we were able to determine the number of detentions and prohibitions at the port level. Our objective was to show that there was simply a massive amount of censorship that occurred by virtue of the scheme of prior restraint. And indeed, we were able to prove that in that 10-year period, there would have been approximately 70,000 prohibitions of books or magazines. And likewise, through the discovery process, we were also able to ascertain the number of prosecutions for obscenities under the criminal code, which did not involve prior restraint, but rather required that charges be laid and then vetted by Crown Counsel. The comparison was striking. For instance, in a four-year period when there had been literally tens of thousands of books banned by Canada Customs, there were only 14 charges under the criminal code. So far, so good. This is exactly what Professor Emerson was talking about when he said the system of prior restraint norm normally brings within the complex of government machinery a far greater amount of communication than a system of subsequent punishment. However, we also needed evidence about how customs actually did their job, how they performed their work. And because of cost considerations, we hadn't conducted any pretrial examinations for discovery. And we took a calculated risk and asked that these customs officers be made available for cross-examination at the trial. Now, this was risky because we had no idea what they were going to say. And every good lawyer says, never ask a question you don't know the answer to. Well, I took the risk, and as it turned out, the evidence they provided to us on the stand was invaluable. And in many respects, I don't think I could have written a script that was better than the evidence that they gave us. I can also say that I've never had so much fun cross-examining witnesses before or since. Time doesn't permit any detailed description of their evidence. Suffice to say that it revealed time and time again just how ill-trained they were to judge a book or film's worth or value. They gave real meaning to the observation of one politician who said that customs officials were, quote, much better qualified to deal with seasonal tariff on cabbages and cucumbers than to pass moral judgment on literature coming into the country, end of quote. 
They and some of the police officers whose beat was vice and who testified for the crown revealed an astonishing ignorance of literature and a, tu a true obliviousness to satire, irony, and social and political commentary. Their evidence revealed not only that they rarely ever read a book from cover to cover, but in some instances they actually did judge a book by its cover. We were able to show that customs had given preferential treatment to sexual expression that was produced by big name and multinational publishers who had lawyers that would lobby customs to ensure that their glossy high value publications gain entry into Canada when publications with similar depictions or descriptions of sexual acts that were imported by little sisters from small publishing houses with low production values were considered obscene. For instance, the expensive metal covered book by, by the singer actor Madonna, simply called Sex, was given the green light by customs, even though it appeared to contain all of the obscenity indicators that would otherwise prove fatal for the books of photographs destined for little sisters. We even deployed one trick to see if we could prove that Customs was targeting to Little Sisters. We asked a friendly but very well established mainstream bookstore to order exactly the same titles that Little Sisters had recently ordered, each of which had been banned. We proved in evidence that when these same books were ordered by the mainstream bookstore, the box was not even open and nothing was banned, even though we made sure that the titles of each of the books was on the outside of the box. Through the discovery and eventually the trial process, we were able to find a number of books that customs had banned that were downright silly, children's books, books of obvious literary merit, and my favorite, Hot, Hotter, and Hottest, a cookbook about jalapeno peppers. <laughs> But we knew we couldn't win this case by proving the odds silly seizure. With literally millions of shipments that were being imported into Canada, there were bound to be some silly seizures, silly seizures and while pointing them out made for great theater in court, we knew a court was not going to strike down the, the legislation or be highly critical of customs um, for that reason alone. We knew we had to address head on what was the bulk of what customs was seizing. The hardcore pornography, and in particular the, the genre of sadomasochism. We had to convince the court that even these books were not obscene. The biggest problem I had was trying to find anyone who would testify that any of these books had literary or artistic merit. Well, a few might qualify, and I found a few literary types that would say so. I knew the bulk of this material simply didn't. And I needed to find out a way to persuade the court that a way to persuade the court to condemn customs and not the books that they were that they were banning. And this is where the case, the case became most interesting. And and this is what I and what I want to address in a little more detail right now. I found myself proceeding down four separate but somewhat related paths. As you recall, I had two clients: a civil liberties association and a gay and lesbian bookstore. The first pass was the most obvious. From my civil liberties clients, I learned a lot about freedom of expression. My main client was a student who did his graduate work at Berkeley, and he worked under the great freedom of expression scholar, Alexander Michael John. Michael John's basic theory was that all citizens are the governors in our society, or the kings. And just as one could never censor the king, rather, just as one could never censor the king, neither can anyone censor the citizens who are the real kings or governors in the society, even though they may have delegated the job of governing to parliament. Now, this was still more or less the, the classic libertarian conception of obscenity. The idea that we will defend to the death the right of people to read or publish what they want, but really holding our noses all the time as that reading or publication occurred. I knew that for some judges, this was an important part of our argument. And, and I was very conscious as to what might fly be, with a rather conservative judiciary, and I had a very conservative judge. But being a civil libertarian was not inconsistent with being a judicial conservative, and it was the civil libertarian button that I, that I first tried to push in that first path that I went down. Now, to put life on those theoretical bones, I called as one of my witnesses one of Canada's most distinguished authors of Canadian history, and one who had probably, well, one who had never written an obscene book in his life. I don't know whether he had ever read one. But his testimony was important. He was white, and he was heterosexual, and he was a living Canadian legend. 
He gave, legit, he gave legitimacy to what otherwise might have been the cause of a perverted minority. His name was Pierre Burton. And for him, the fight in court was inescapably, inescapably linked to his fight as a soldier in World War II. And this is what he said in his testimony. He said, we were attacking the very people who burn books and destroy books, either in public or in secret, and I've been opposed to that ever since. Now, testimony like that was important. However, it never would have won the day, and certainly that was my view, and what I think I was right in the end, and that's because the civil libertarian perspective had lost most of its gloss as a result of the Butler decision. There, the court upheld the obscenity law because it considered obscenity not immoral itself, but harmful, especially to women. I needed more than the Pierre Burtons and the civil libertarians of the world to win my case, and so this took me down three further separate but related paths. Three paths, but with one common destination. The destination, I hoped, was that the books and other expressive material that Canada Customs considered obscene, and which indeed was likely the view of most Canadians and virtually every judge, nevertheless had value, even if it was not a, a literary or artistic value. I wanted to prove that sexual expression was every bit as, as important as commercial or even political expression. Excuse me. I started doing a lot of reading. And yes, I read a lot of dirty books. <laughs> if I was going to sell the court with the idea that these books had value, then I needed to believe it myself. That was not always easy, since quite frankly, on first and even second impression, the books seemed simply like trash to me or smut for smut's sake, as the courts had described it in previous cases. But the, the reading that was most important to the development of the case, certainly along this second path I was on, was the writing I found about transgressive sexuality and expression. I needed to, I needed to persuade the court about the importance of this transgressive expression, not just because they were works of the imagination, which of course they were, but of the importance of this imaginative exercise. This was my second path. I started with well-known legal scholars, but then I scoured the libraries and bookstores for the views of the non-legal community. I found this great quote from Kafka, who wrote this in a letter to a friend in 1904. He says, I think we ought to only read the kind of books that wound and stab us. If the book we are reading doesn't wake us up with a blow on the head, what are we reading it for? A book must be the ax for the frozen sea inside us. That is my belief. Now, I was introduced to many works of non-legal writers such as Kafka and others such as Camille Paglia, Camille Paglia, who described pornographic images as shock devices to break down bourgeois norms of decorum, reserve, and, and tidiness. I discovered a whole new world of such writers. And I put all of this writing before the court and called witnesses who supported that perspective. But having gone down this path got me thinking about a different and third path. I realized that pornography was both a work of the imagination and should be protected when that is all it is. But I realized that some of it, at least, also reflected people's realities. It sometimes depicts or describes what people, or at least some people, do in the privacy of their bedrooms. And I wondered, how could it be that if our sexual lives were not criminal or prohibited, that the words or images that depict or describe our sexual lives could be criminal or prohibited? At the very least, I thought this was worth exploring. I began to talk to sex therapists and eventually called some to testify. I thought if I could show that what customs considered obscene, what, was even normal, what even normal people engaged in, seemed to me that that could go some way in causing the court to hold that the depictions or descriptions of the sexual activity might not be obscene. Now, customs had a long-standing practice of banning anything that depicted or described anal sex. And while heterosexuals engaged in anal sex and the restraint porn that depicted it, just about all gay porn was about anal sex. So it was important to talk about the actual practice of anal sex for gay men and why it wasn't deviant and in fact was commonplace and a perfectly healthy sexual practice. We called lay and expert witnesses for this purpose. 
We took the same approach and had the same success when it came to the genre of sadomasochistic pornography, S&M, the real bete noir of customs. We were able to demonstrate to the court that S&M sexual practices were for the most part consensual and acts of fantasy and theater. There was lots of testimony about sex and it was presented tastefully and proudly. I doubt that any courtroom before or since has ever seen such a display of positive sexual energy. It was a very important part of the trial. But persuading the court that a book or film could not be obscene simply because it depicts or describes what people may do in the privacy of their bed bedrooms was still not going to be enough. There was simply something different about the public display of such sexual acts, whether live as in sex shows or even when displayed on the pages of a book that was most troubling for our legislators and courts. I needed something more. I made contact with a cultural anthropologist from Columbia University in New York who eventually testified. Dr. Carol Vance explained to me and eventually just demonstrated to the court that the history of censorship of sexual expression is really a history of, the, of repression of the sexual practices of minorities and worse, a history of the repression of the minorities themselves. Customs, of course, denied being homophobic, but it was no accident that the main kind of obscenity that seemed to occupy most of their time was homosexual sex. Could I argue that gay porn was somehow different and better than straight porn? Was it possible to even get the feminists on side who were so fixated on pornography as being all about violence against women? I spoke to as many gay and lesbian and transgendered people I could, and eventually I called many of them as witnesses to the trial. Witness after witness explained the importance of their first experience with gay or lesbian pornography. All of them explained how it was the first time they had ever read about other people like them. They had been brought up in a culture and a society that regarded them as freaks and whose sexual practices were deviant. Yet all of a sudden, they came upon books and magazines that were about them. And for them, this was an incredibly liberating experience. It was then that I realized that I should be able to defend the many books, magazines, and videos that may have had no artistic or literary merit, but because they had social and political merit. My epiphany wasn't just that pornography that was at issue in this case was just as important as commercial or political expression. My, my epiphany was that it was political expression. It was at this juncture that it finally dawned on me that my case was not just about freedom of expression, but it was about equality. And it was the intersection of these two important constitutional values that made this obscenity case unique in Canadian legal history. I was on my fourth and most important path. I decided to call the author who might have been described as public enemy number one by customs. Her name was Pat Califia, and she was the preeminent writer of S&M for the lesbian population and wrote some very, very disturbing work. Her book was called Macho Sluts and had been detained and prohibited by Canada Customs several times. I decided to call her to explain her work story by story and book by book. She had other books. I was worried about her testimony when I met her the night before for the first time as she was from San Francisco. She looked very much the part of the macho slut. Butch, leather clad, heavily tattooed, many piercings. But she showed up in court dressed and coiffed as she put it herself like a librarian. <laughs> it, it turned out that her testimony was extremely important if not pivotal in the case. It was likely her more than anyone else that caused the judge to conclude that S&M was not per se obscene as customs had declared it to be. But even more important, after hearing her and all the witnesses lay an expert in reading all the exhibits, this is how the trial judge characterized the gay and lesbian pornography that customs had been routinely detaining or prohibiting. And this is what he said. The defining characteristic of homosexuals the element that distinguishes them from everyone else in society is their sexuality. Naturally, their art and literature are extensively concerned with this central characteristic of their humanity. As attested by several of the plaintiff's witnesses, erotica produced for heterosexual audiences performs largely an entertainment function, but homosexual erotica is far more important to homosexuals. These witnesses established that sexual text and imagery produced for homosexuals serves as an affirmation of their sexuality and as a socializing force. 
that it normalizes the sexual practices that larger society has historically considered to be deviant. And it organizes homosexuals as a group and enhances their political power. Now, the Supreme Court of Canada likewise held the customs regime had discriminated against gay and lesbians both because it targeted gay and lesbian material, but more importantly, because of the importance of that gay and lesbian material. I don't have the time to go into much more detail. Suffice to say, we accomplished in part in what we set out to prove, namely Emerson's thesis that prior restraint results in over-censorship as well as irrational, arbitrary, stupid, and discriminatory censorship. Well, it was only a matter of time that custom struck again, and this time banning two comic books. We wasted no time in fighting back. But this time we believed that it was completely unfair that our clients would have to bear the financial burden of yet another constitutional challenge, particularly once we learned through another round of discovery that Customs had done very little, in fact, to remedy its past practices, even though it represented to the Supreme Court of Canada that it had. We thought this was going to require us to amount at what was, in effect, the same case that we had already fought and thought we won. What occurred over the next seven years was not so much a battle over customs practices or censorship, but a case involving access to justice. We had, had obtained what we considered, or what in fact was a, an extraordinary order in the trial court, that customs was required to fund our clients' legal costs in the litigation, irrespective of the outcome. However, when the issue went to the Supreme Court of Canada, we lost on, that, on the basis that the majority of the court didn't think that the case was exceptional enough to warrant such a radical cost order. This was a huge setback, not just for Little Sisters, for the many people and organizations who thought that such advanced cost orders were going to be a key to achieving some semblance of access to justice in Canada. In fact, courts are pretty stingy when it comes to, obtain, to uh, granting cost orders even after a case is over. The plain fact is that legal costs are the single most important impediment to access to justice in this country and requiring the government to pay those costs in important public interest litigation, even if the parties are unsuccessful, would go a long way of encouraging lawyers to do this kind of work pro bono. In the recent Carter case, the right to die case, we won at the trial level and were awarded our costs, but we lost it in the Court of Appeal on the basis of stare decisis, and then we lost our cost award. The Court of Appeal said that, that even though it's possible to award the losing side costs in public interest litigation in exceptional cases, that our case simply wasn't exceptional enough. And if Carter was not an exceptional enough case, then I find it hard to imagine what would be. When we get to the Supreme Court of Canada and Carter, our hope is not only to have the court recognize the constitutional right to die, but to say something important on the role of cost awards, that the, on the role that cost awards can play in ensuring access to justice. Back to Little Sisters versus Big Brother. The end of the story is a relatively happy one. When we started the first round of litigation back in 1990, Customs had been inspecting every shipment, every shipment that was being imported by Little Sisters and detaining and banning hundreds of books and videos. I'm happy to report that since the second round of litigation that was commenced in response to the two comic books, not one shipment destined for Little Sisters has ever been inspected and nothing again has ever been detained, let alone prohibited by Canada Customs. So the story ends with they lived happily ever after, at least in jurisprudential terms. I, 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 I see that um, I have uh, perhaps maybe five more minutes, which I would like to um, do a bit of a paradigm shift and tell you a little story on the Carter case, and then I'll finish. Um, one of the things we had to prove in Carter was the law which uh, criminalized any kind of physician-assisted dying was causing serious harm. We did that in a number of ways, but unlike the Rodriguez case, which focused only on one woman's plight, we made sure that the court heard the stories of many people, and not just our clients, who were suffering from various illnesses, and we had them talk about their fears and actual experiences. We had to demonstrate to the court that notwithstanding the very best medicine, including palliative care, there were still people who would experience intolerable suffering and for whom death was preferable to life. The Crown called this our blood and excrement evidence. We pled guilty. We said that the Crown wanted to sanitize the case by just having it be a battle of experts. We needed to show just how much needless suffering the law was causing real people in the real world. And I think this evidence was very helpful. 
But we also needed to demonstrate that these were not vulnerable people, but people who, when in, when in their healthy lives, were strong, vibrant, independent people. In the words of Gloria Taylor, people who wanted to die in a manner that reflected how they lived. We had much evidence of that. But I want to end with the story of the widow of one man who died of ALS, because it was his story amongst so many that I think captures the essence of our case. These are his wife's words, Nika, about her husband, Robert. Nika said this, to understand Robert's position and life-ending journey, one needs to know something about him, his personality, likes and, dislike, and dislikes, a potted characterization of him because a man is someone, not a cipher. He was a brilliantly intelligent and an intellectual Renaissance man, equally at home in the arts and sciences, a potter, a sculptor, a chef, a marine scientist, a science researcher. His first degree was philosophy. His master's degree was in oceanography. He spoke six languages. Robert was a great walk on tour with wit always building the tension in his stories until the denouement broke us down in tears of laughter. He was a pond farming specialist, a fisheries author, a seaweed researcher, a teacher, above all, a communicator a person unable to walk down a street without giving a treatise on the flora, fauna, architecture, and history of the area. If any one of our children developed a fifth of his knowledge, they would be educated indeed. He was always looking to learn something new, never hesitant at trying to develop a new skill, although some things failed him, like playing the saxophone and singing in the choir. He believed a day of living was wasted if he didn't learn something new or teach something new to another. Robert told me, and I believed him, that life was more than just breathing or existing. Life was learning, doing, being involved. Above all, living, ab above all, living was about communicating. He loved solitude and quiet that allowed him to read, learn, and think. But he loved company, to teach, to share humor, to share knowledge. He knew his illness would leave him incommunicado, but still breathing, trapped in a paralyzed body, a living hell, a nightmare. Worse, this nightmare of extended dying would have no raison d'etre. He told me that he felt there was no value to a life of mere existence, merely breathing, not to him nor to anyone. He told me that he believed that for others it would only impose a burden, even if it were one that they were willing to bear, and we were. For himself, it achieved nothing. He had no religious belief that it, that it dictated it was good to suffer. He had no hope of remission, improvement, or delay, just the inexorable decline into full, silent paralysis, not even able to complain or praise, a daily grind of being attended to, unable to communicate, to do anything, unable to give. Now, Robert died in his home, surrounded by his family, after his family prepared him a dish of curry, and he actually wrote in his notebook just before he died, curry to die for. <laughs> and after taking a few mouth mouthfuls, he raised his fist in a feeble power salute and gently passed away. It was evidence like this, stories like this, that caused the, ch uh, the Chief Justice of our Court of Appeal in dissent to hold that the law that criminalized physician-assisted dying and which was, which was defended by the government as being to preserve life, was actually a deprivation of life. And I'd like to end by just quoting from the Chief Justice who said this, the meaning of the term of life in the context of Section 7 includes a full range of potential human experiences. The value a person ascribes to his or her life may include physical, intellectual, emotional, cultural, and spiritual experiences, the engagement of one's senses, intellect, and feelings, meeting challenges, enjoying successes, and accepting or overcoming defeats, forming friendships and other relationships, cooperating, helping others, being part of a team, enjoying a moment, anticipating the future, remembering the past. Life's meaning, and by extension, the life interest in Section 7, is intimately connected to the way a person values his or her lived experience. The point at which the meaning of life is lost, 
when life's positive attributes are so diminished as to render life valueless, when suffering overwhelms all else, is an intensely personal decision which everyone has the right to make for him or herself. Thank you for listening to my stories. So much, and um, I think we've all been enchanted just sitting, listening to the the depth of knowledge and experience and creativity uh, in the litigation process, and uh, bringing to life the impact of law on uh, on real people's lives, and bringing that into the courtroom. So we do have about 15 minutes for comments or questions. I would ask you to please go to the microphone because we are recording this session and uh, identify yourself and to make your comments or questions uh, brief so that uh, as many people as possible can, can intervene. So, um, so if you have questions or comments, uh, there's a mic on the uh, Okay, our <laughs> So my name is Daniel Jukai, I'm a professor here. Uh, so I wonder whether you can tell us a bit more about the access to justice dimension, because many of the things that you describe are actually very costly. One can imagine expert testimony and involving witnesses and this thing. So how does it actually run on a daily basis? How do you get it to work over the range of cases that you brought before? Um, I'm going to maybe um, ask, I'm going to suggest that maybe the question you're asking me, and you correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, Daniel, is how do I make a living doing what I do? <laughs> <laughs> Which I assume is what you're asking. That too, that too. And, 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 the, and the way I do it, actually, for the most part, I mean, every once in a while I have a paying client. Um, um, <laughs> but for many of the cases I do, um, the clients who come to me really can't afford charter litigation. I mean, who can? I mean, it's extremely costly. And the deal I work, make with most of them is um, I say, um, I'll work as hard on preparing the case um, if you'll work really hard on fundraising. I don't want to, I don't want to take anything from your pocket, out of your pocket, but if you can fundraise in the community and raise some money, um, then that'll be a sort of a fair trade. Um, that usually doesn't come to much. So the other part of my, the bargain is I say that if I, if I win the case or whether I win or lose and the court orders costs, then I'll keep the costs. And believe me, this is not a good business model. Uh, this isn't like um, personal injury lawyer, class action lawyers who work on contingencies, and there's a huge pot of gold at the end of some of the rainbows in those cases. If you get your costs, you never get 100% of your actual legal fees. You get some percentage of it. But it, it's enough to, to it was en it's enough to keep me going. And it, it, it bothers me to no end when, um, when government lawyers, we're all, on the, we're, we're, all, we're, we're all doing cases in the public interest, when the government lawyers, um, on the instructions of their government clients, um, seem to be so um, 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 resentful, want to be no better word, that we would be given our costs. And unfortunately, the courts seem to be very slow to order costs. So I've become quite obsessed with the law of costs, even though it doesn't sound very interesting. It is the way in which public interest litigation is actually financed, mostly in this country. Hi, thank you, Mr. Ray. I'm Angela Campbell. So I'm wondering about how, in your work, you imagine the idea of vulnerability. Um, because so many of the people in groups who we represented are socially perceived as vulnerable or marginalized, either socially, politically, or economically. And it's almost like a trope because it's repeated over and over again in so much of the litigation. And it can be really useful in some ways because it suggests that there's this power balance in much of the, the constitutional litigation that you've worked on. But on the other hand, it also strikes me 
as hugely dangerous. As what? As hugely dangerous, potentially. So I'm wondering how you, in your work, um, and particularly in Carter, um, how you how you would use or imagine the idea of vulnerability with respect to the litigants who you represented, um, and how it how it plays out in your in your um, particularly in your conversations with the judges before whom you move here. Well, um, for those of you who may have been at the seminar and the, at, at the lunch hour, I, I don't know how many of you were there, but I, I, I actually sort of dealt with this somewhat, if I understand your question, Angela. Um, the, one of the, the, the biggest areas, the, the, what, in the Carter case, the, um, the groups that I was most concerned about uh, were um, the disabled rights groups who were saying that the uh, the le legislation which criminalized the physicians as dying was designed to protect disabled people because they were vulnerable. Um, I had to take on the disabled rights organizations. Um, and I, I think I said this afternoon that what happened in the courtroom was sort of the verbal equivalent of, of um, murder wheelchair, um, murder ball wheelchair rather, um, me sort of fighting my fellow disabled people, um, because I had to try to show that they weren't actually nearly as vulnerable as they thought they were. And, 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 and I, I, I don't have the time to, to go through that in, in a whole lot of detail right now. But the point is, is that, and I'm kind of going back to the comment that that um, professor made about me, I had to show that my clients um, who happened to be disabled too, um, were um, uh, were the vulnerable people, and the the, the, pe the the other disabled people who thought that they were more vulnerable, in fact, weren't. So it is a tricky business. Um, it is a tricky business in trying to paint your clients um, as the as the um, as the most vulnerable and the most victimized by the, by the by the legislation. I don't know if that answers it very well. microphone a bit closer to it, it's a bit hard to hear. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, so, having worked at a civil liberties organization, and also being part of a social media group, um, the social movement groups see, which I have taken, see litigation as a strategic way to change society's view on certain things. Um, whereas the lawyers I've worked with see the law as a way to maintain precedents that have passed. Um, for instance, the, the Via Rail case, where Canada was thinking of taking these train cars that would have had a negative effect on mobility. Um, that I see as a maintaining of precedent. So as a constitutional lawyer, is your role to advance your client's policy goals or just to maintain <coughs> the wins in society that they've already achieved? Well, most of the time, um, uh, when I'm the charter litigation I'm doing is we're uh, challenging existing laws and the status quo and um, 
charter litigation can be regressive litigation if the laws that someone is challenging are good laws and progressive, progressive laws. And there was a school of thought, certainly after the charter was first enacted, that the charter was not a charter of rights but a charter of wrongs because it would be used by big corporations to sort of roll back legislation that was enacted to advance the right of workers, such as workers' compensation, labor legislation, health legislation, that kind of thing. Um, and, and, and to some extent, that still goes on. I try not to be involved in that kind of litigation. I happen to believe that the Charter, although not a panacea, not the only tool in, in, a, in, the, in, in, in our toolbox um, of sort of pursuing social justice, is a really important uh, tool and, is, um, and, can, and has been and, and will continue to uh, make the world a better place. Um, it's, just, it's not going to be perfect, but it, look, we've, the, the gay and lesbian community has made astounding gains in a very, very short time using the Charter. Um, the, uh, who would have thought um, that uh, the Supreme Court of Canada would have struck down the prostitution laws to the advantage of sex workers? So I actually think that the Charter is a um, pretty good thing. Okay. Perhaps I'll ask a question, and uh, since no one's at the mic, uh, because I think one of the really interesting aspects of your talk was the ways in which your case became more compelling in terms of freedom of expression when you connected it to equality issues, and particularly the rights of minority sexual community gays and lesbians. Um, and I wanted to ask, what, how does that play out in a different way with respect to hate speech? and um, where you have the equality and expression intersections aligning potentially in different ways. And I'm not sure if you've been involved in any of the hate speech litigation or how, how that is. Yeah, uh, I've always had a really hard time um, um, deciding what to do about hate speech. Um, and I have done a little bit of work in the area of hate speech. And I, I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I don't think I'm going to have a very good answer for you other than I... Um, hate speech, laws that purport to um, criminalize hate speech um, are very dangerous laws because there's a fine line between um, hate speech and, and political commentary. But the difference for me between um, um, if challenge, challenge, challenging a law that criminalizes hate speech and challenging a law that criminalizes sexual expression is I don't know that I would be able to find any value in the hate speech, whereas I found the value even in what was what would have met the definition of obscenity um, under the criminal code. I don't. I, I I would have struggled to find any value in hate speech. Uh, could you go to the? Uh, I know it's a little bit of a hike, but uh, <laughs> you don't mind. Mr. Ali, first of all, I'm Alan Stein. I'm a graduate of McGill University, and uh, I taught here for many years as well. I want to say something to you, which, uh, which I feel everyone should know. You are a very unique person in the type of cases you're handling, many of which are pro bono. I don't know if you know my father, my late father, was the lawyer, A.O. Stein, who met together with Frank Scott, who was former dean and constitutional law professor here at McGill University pleaded the longer on these the case successfully all the way up to the Supreme Court. And I'll never forget that when my father was first engaged by Ron Barelli, he realized in assuming the blessing the Prime Minister of this province that to act alone would be very difficult and so he solicited the senior lawyers in all the big offices here in Montreal and not one of them would handle it. And that's how he eventually engaged the late Frank Scott, former dean of McGill University for activism. Mm -hmm. So I say to you, you are a very unique lawyer, and my hand, and I want to compliment you on handling these kind of cases. Thank you. Healy in a moment, but just before do, to say some final closing words and, and thanks on our behalf, 
But before uh, doing so, on behalf of uh, my colleague Nandini Ramanujan, who is the uh, Program and Executive Director of the Center, and myself, I wanted to expend, uh, send a, uh, give a special thanks to Sharon Webb, who uh, did a, a wonderful job in organizing uh, tonight's event, and to Julia Betts, who is a recent graduate of our faculty, who is also working with our center. So it's now my... Uh, It's now my pleasure to ask uh, the Honorable Patrick Healy, who's a judge of the Court of Quebec in the Criminal and Penal Division, um, and who prior to his appointment was a professor at the McGill Faculty of Law, who continues to teach at the faculty, and who is also a member of our Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism, to say, come forward and say some closing comments and to thank uh, Mr. Arbe on our behalf. Patrick. Joe is a, a remarkable man and a remarkable lawyer. Um, I've had the privilege to teach with Joe, and I hope we will still do that in the future uh, and collaborate on a number of things. Um, I can't remember when it was, Danielle, but when the new law library was opened, I think it was 1998 or 1999, uh, I don't remember, but there was a challenge that was issued at that time. Colleen, you were here too. And I think the challenge was directed primarily at students, which was to find an appropriate inscription that would uh, be placed on the outer wall of, of the building. And the uh, student sub who submitted it, uh, it, it, was a, it was a masterful choice. And the inscription was, leave no stone unturned. And if you go out there, when you leave, you'll see it. That's Joe. That's Joe, and it's not just about the arguments. It's about pushing the law to its, its limits. It's not just about the, the, the fanciful arguments, the imagination of the law, which, which he incarnates. It's about little details. You've heard him say many times over, and I would just call this to your attention, the evidence we had to prove. We had to bring witnesses, right? This is real advocacy. Joe is a consummate advocate, and I have only the highest admiration for him. I have to say that uh, I don't have words that allow me to describe uh, adequately the, the kind of admiration that I have for, for Joe's advocacy, but it's a kind of professional passion. Um, tempered by judgment. And I have to say that one of the things that Joe's work reminds me of, and I mean by this the highest possible compliment, is that he reminds me of a speech that was given in 1950 by William Faulkner when he received the Nobel Prize for Literature. And he said uh, that his work was, uh, he hoped, to create out of the materials of the human spirit something which did not exist before. If you think about a case like Carter, that's where we're at. Trying to create out of the materials of human existence something of which we are not now certain. Now, Faulkner in 1950, uh, you have to appreciate the time, but Faulkner uh, said that there was a universal fear at, in his world at that time, and he expressed it this way. When will I be blown up because of the atomic bomb? And he said, because of this fear, the young man or woman writing today has forgotten the problems of the human heart in conflict with itself, which alone can make good writing because only that is worth writing about, worth the agony and the sweat. And then, if you'll permit me one other paragraph. Faulkner went on to say, he must learn them again. He, same thing, Danielle, he, she. He must learn them again. He must teach himself that the basis of all things is to be afraid. And teaching himself that, forget it forever, leaving no room in his workshop for anything but the old verities and truths of the heart, 
the old universal truths lacking which any story is ephemeral and doomed, love and honor and pity and pride and compassion and sacrifice. Under, until he does so, he labors under a curse. He, he writes not of love but of lust, of defeats in which nobody loses anything of value, of victories without hope and, worst of all, without pity or compassion. His griefs grieve on no universal bone, bones, leaving no scars. He writes not of the heart, but of the glands. That is not Joe. Once again, I would like on your behalf to thank Joe for a fabulous speech. It's not about stories. It's about just what I said, the old verities and truths of the heart in their judicial form. Now, uh, if I may, Colleen, I, I, I would like to invite Sylvia to come, come up to present to Joe the Robert Litvak Award, for which we're here tonight, and uh, I'm sure that uh, it will be her great pleasure to do that. Well, we have heard so many eloquent and moving words tonight. There's absolutely nothing I can add to them, except that Job was brought here to receive an award, and so far he hasn't. So here it is. Joseph Arbeck, and with this, um, our evening ceremony and celebrations, uh, I've come to the book.